If it's Tuesday, breaking news, a major ruling for the Supreme Court siding with Texas, allowing a sweeping immigration law to take effect that gives local police the power to arrest migrants. It's a move that the Biden administration and three dissenting Supreme Court justices say could create chaos on the southern border. Plus, the former president looks to trump Ohio's Republican establishment in today's Senate primary contest as the presumptive nominee faces new blowback for baselessly accusing Jewish Democrats of hating Israel and their own religion. And on the road again, President Biden hits the road in battleground states while ramping up his attacks on rival Donald Trump's red hot rhetoric by blasting his latest comments on Jewish Democrats and his defense of the January 6th rioters. Hello and welcome to Meet the Press Now. I'm Ryan Nobles on a very busy Tuesday with the direction of the Republican Party and the turbulence of Donald Trump's influence top of mind for voters, many of whom are voting today in primaries across the country. We'll get to all of that in a moment. But we begin with this breaking news out of the Supreme Court. The high court this afternoon gave Texas a temporary green light to enforce a controversial immigration law known as SB4. It means that Texas law enforcement officials now have the unprecedented power to arrest, detain, prosecute, and deport migrants suspected of illegally crossing the U.S.-Mexico border. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton celebrated the news, calling it a huge win. Moments ago, the White House responded, saying, quote, they fundamentally disagree with the ruling and that the law was another example of, quote, Republican officials politicizing the border. In its ruling this afternoon, the court's conservative majority did not fully explain why it made this decision. It comes as the Biden administration has argued that the federal government, not the states, has the sole authority over the nation's immigration laws. And as we noted, the ruling is temporary, and the court could decide to reverse its decision as the case unfolds. But for now, SB 4 is the law of the land in Texas. In a scathing dissent, the court's liberal justices warned of the decision's consequences, writing, the court gives a green light to a law that will upend the long-standing federal-state balance of power and sow chaos, when the only court to consider the law concluded that it is likely unconstitutional. This law implicates serious issues that are subject to ongoing political debate, and Texas's novel scheme requires careful and reasoned consideration in the courts to determine why provisions may be unconstitutional. Now, the dispute comes as the crisis at the southern border and the issue of immigration are expected to dominate the 2024 election cycle. And it's the latest clash between the Biden administration and the state of Texas over immigration enforcement. Joining me now is our team of reporters, NBC News Supreme Court reporter Lawrence Hurley, NBC News Homeland Security correspondent Julia Ainsley, and NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli. So, Lawrence, uh, let's start with you. Uh, this did catch some of us a bit by surprise because the court yesterday said that they were going to keep this in place for an indefinite amount of time, as we're learning that indefinite is certainly up to the discretion of the person who declares it as such. It does seem like a bit of a 180. Explain what happened over the past 24 hours. What seemed possible here, because we can't know for sure, but what seems possible is that the court was close to issuing this decision yesterday. Mm -hmm. But because uh, Justice Alito had issued a temporary stay before that was expiring last evening, uh, and they hadn't obviously reached the outcome that they wanted to, so they just extended it a bit further, gave them a bit more time to think about it, to finish all these opinions, because there's three different opinions uh, by different justices. Uh, clearly, the Liberals wanted to dissent and make their feelings known. Justice Amy Coney Barrett wrote a separate opinion to sort of explain what she was thinking. So, you know, they wanted to get their opinions out there, and that's probably why it ended up being uh, delayed a bit. All right, Lawrence, we'll talk more about the decision here, but I want to go to Julia now and talk about what this means most immediately for the situation at the border. I mean, is Texas prepared to begin enforcing this immediately? And do they have the capacity and resources to implement a law like this? 
think they're going to have to start to put their money where their mouth is now, Ryan, because this is an enormous undertaking to be able to train not just local law enforcement on how to decide who to arrest. Remember, it's anyone they suspect is in the country illegally in a state where 40 percent of the residents are Latino. So already they could be violating civil rights with that. And we've heard from very loudly from national groups who are worried about that, but also just capacity. If you think about some of these really small rural parts of Texas already with full jails already trying to figure out how to use their limited dollars. How are they supposed to allocate resources to enforce this law when they have to start checking the immigration status of people at traffic stops and making arrests and violations? And then further down that road, think about judges, judges who are not trained in immigration law. Immigration law has always squared completely within the hands of the Justice Department, who appoint immigration judges who decide whether or not someone can stay in the country or not. Now you have people without any kind of that training without the understanding of really complex asylum bars and who qualifies and who does it and what kind of rights somebody might have. Now those people are making decisions on who can stay in the country and who can't. And they're not prioritizing people who might be, say, recently arrived versus someone who's been here for years and has generations of family here mm -hmm. just merely if they're undocumented. So really, this could sow, as the White House is saying, chaos and confusion. And it really is quite shocking to see the reasoning, and Lawrence can get into this more, the, from the justices today, the conservative justices who put forward this opinion saying that it's because they wanted to minimize harm. It's hard to see how that argument stands when they're going to allow this to go into effect even for a temporary period. It could very well, though, be, Ryan, that Texas can't it, ramp up their resources in time for whatever temporary period this would be allowed. So we really need to pay close attention to what's happening in Texas in the coming days. But as we know, the governor and the attorney general there see this as a big win, and they're willing to put this in place as soon as they can. So, Lawrence, expand on that a little bit so our viewers kind of understand and maybe are not fully clued in on the trajectory of this uh, this bill through the court system. The Supreme Court is not weighing in on the merits of, no. of this at all. They're just talking about whether or not the stay should be put in place. Where does the bill actually sit? Right, I guess it's a law. Where does the law sit right now in terms of its trajectory through the court system? And could it eventually be something the Supreme Court weighs in on? Definitely, yeah. I mean, there could be action really soon, and this case could get up back at the Supreme Court really quickly as well, because an appeals court, the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals, is currently considering the Biden administration's effort to put this law on hold separately. And that was the reasoning that Justice Barrett and joined by Justice Brett Kavanaugh said, well, we don't want to intervene at this point because this appeals court hasn't weighed in yet. Uh, and so if the appeals court blocked the law, then the law would be blocked all over again. Mm -hmm. If the appeals court doesn't block the law, then the Biden administration can come straight back to the Supreme Court, which Justice Barrett said they would be, you know, fine to do. So mm -hmm. everything on the ground could change really quickly, which is kind of interesting because, you know, the liberal justices are obviously saying this sows chaos. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, when the Supreme Court said it would keep uh, Donald Trump on the ballot in Colorado... One of their reasons for saying that was because they didn't want to unleash chaos. So, you know, you could see a bit of a contradiction there. Yeah. So let's go to the White House now and, and get their reaction to all of this, Mike Memoli. Uh, do they view this as a setback? I mean, what is the next course of action uh, for the Biden administration as it relates to this ruling? Well, I think from the White House's perspective, they know that there is still more to come on this issue. You have to have that hearing in the appeals court level before it might potentially then return back to the Supreme Court. In the meantime, I think you can look at this from the lens of both politics and policy. I don't think it's an accident that the statement that you already read par partially from, uh, from uh, Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House press secretary reacting to this, calling this uh, sowing chaos and confusion. It's not a mistake that that echoes the exact language we have in the very strong dissent from Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, because as the president has pointed out, uh, and we remember so clearly that uh, off script moment he had at the State of the Union address where he re referenced directly the Supreme Court and disagreeing with some of their previous decisions. This is going to be another one. The president likes to say Justice Jackson is uh, smarter than the rest of the justices, and I think they will amplify uh, her dissent here, especially as we move forward. The other part of this, I think, is highlighting the campaign moving forward, two different pieces. One is, where is the president right now? He's out on the West Coast. He's in Nevada right now. He's heading to Arizona later tonight, two states where uh, the, the Latino vote is going to be critical. The campaign is launching 
uh, uh, Latinos cone Biden today. So this is obviously an issue of immigration that they want to uh, basically run on and turn back on the Republicans, especially using the failure of that Senate compromise in the House as a, a ammunition to point out that Republicans only want the, the, po the, the political fight, not necessarily the solution that's involved, but also to underscore the fact that the Supreme Court itself is a voting issue for so many uh, mm -hmm. Americans. We think, think about it most clearly in terms of reproductive rights, abortion, and the Dobbs decision, but this is another thing that they hope will animate Democratic voters in the fall as well, re recognizing the importance uh, of the Supreme Court here and the fact that the Supreme Court just over a decade ago inter made a contradictory ruling on a different uh, bill in a different state, by the way, Arizona. Mm -hmm. right? and, and Julia, I know the politics of all of this is not necessarily your lane, but uh, let's see if I can frame this question in a way uh, that you can understand where <laughs> I'm thinking here. Uh, to Mike's point, it does seem as though the Biden administration is setting things up here, right? This, to a certain extent now, is going to give Greg Abbott the tools that he claims will give him the ability to try and calm things down at the border. Uh, but to your point, it's not an easy task. It's obviously been very difficult for the federal government. Uh, isn't there the possibility that this backfires on Texas now that they have this ability to at least enforce it on some level? Yeah, I see where you're going with this. It's like, okay, if you want this to be your problem, take it on. Let's show let's show us what you can do, and you'll see how hard this problem really can be. I, I think there's it's apples and oranges, too, because as we've seen, as Texas has put through some of these tougher restrictions like razor wire, like buoys in the Rio Grande, we have seen more migrants go to places like Arizona and California, so they're not in charge of a national border. The other thing is, if they were really going to take on the, the charge of deportation, that's incredibly difficult for these judges to be able to issue deportation orders. I think that's another challenge to this legally of whether or not they have that authority. And then also, what do you do about countries like Venezuela who refuse to take their migrants back? These are the realities that this administration has been dealing with, realities that really the Trump administration didn't have because you didn't have this influx from Venezuela just four years ago. And so, yes, again, it's, it's a matter of, okay, let's see how you would actually take this on. I think the problem is, is that this law really isn't created to try to take numbers down at the border. It probably will do much more to just instill fear of people who've been living in Texas for a very long time. Okay, more to come on this. This is obviously not the end of this discussion by any stretch. Lawrence, Julia, Mike, thank you all for being here. We appreciate it, especially as we're dealing with this breaking news. But coming up, voters are voting. We'll head to Ohio, where today's primary is testing Trump's grip on the party and will have major implications for which party controls the Senate in November. Plus, Trump, former Trump advisor Peter Navarro reports to federal prison for defying Congress. His final message before going behind bars is straight ahead. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. And as we love to say around here, if it's Tuesday, voters are voting somewhere. And today, five states are holding presidential primaries, but all eyes are on a key Republican Senate contest in Ohio. And what's being viewed as a test of Donald Trump's power over his party and the direction of that party. It comes as the presumptive nominee is again making headlines for his inflammatory and divisive rhetoric, this time invoking an anti-Semitic trope while talking about Jewish Americans during an interview with Seb Gorka, a former Trump administration official. The Democrat Party hates Israel. Any Jewish person that votes for Democrats uh, hates their religion. They hate everything about Israel, and they should be ashamed of themselves because Israel will be destroyed. The Biden campaign in the White House blasted the comments, calling them hateful and toxic. Senator Chuck Schumer, who is, of course, the highest ranking Jewish lawmaker in the United States, called the remarks highly partisan and hateful. Notably, rather than downplay their candidates' comments like they did with the former president's bloodbath remarks over the weekend, the Trump campaign is actually doubling down with even more inflammatory and baseless rhetoric, saying in a statement, quote, President Trump is right. The Democrat Party has turned into a full-blown anti-Israel, anti-Semitic, pro-terrorist cabal. We should note that this is not the first time that Mr. Trump has accused American Jews of disloyalty. He made similar comments both during and after his presidency. And in today's Ohio Republican Senate primary, all three GOP candidates have expressed support to the, for the former president. But Mr. Trump is backing the businessman Bernie Moreno, 
who has attacked his opponent, Ohio Secretary of State Frank LaRose, and State Senator Matt Dolan as rhinos, or Republicans, in name only. NBC's Dasha Burns is covering all things Trump for us from Palm Beach, Florida. And our resident Buckeye state politics expert, Henry Gomez, joins us from Ohio, where he's been traveling around the state on this election day. So, uh, Dasha, let's start with you. You know, after the bloodbath comments over the weekend, the campaign really tried to clarify them, maybe tone them down a bit. Seems like a completely different response to these comments about Jewish Democrats. They, they are doubling down on what Trump said about Jewish voters. What does this tell us about how they view this kind of rhetoric from their candidate? Well, number one, I think the team that surrounds the former president now does fundamentally understand that Trump is who he is, that he is going to say what he's going to say, that they can't control much of what comes out of his mouth in interviews or at these rallies, but that they can control sort of the response and the strategy around it. And I think here we've seen for a while that they've been watching President Biden struggle on this issue kind of in both directions, right? He's got people on his left flank that are unhappy with how he's handling this and people on his right flank that are unhappy with how they're handling this. And there might be a sense here that, look, former President Trump, if there's one thing he has, it's a it's very um, sort of forward, outspoken uh, strategies when it comes to dealing with uh, dealing with matters of foreign affairs. Now, some of people may criticize that, but that is how he handles things. And so leaning in rather than trying to walk back on an issue where they see his opponent uh, is, is struggling is one way to handle this, as opposed to the bloodbath comments, which were sort of more general. This is really for a specific issue uh, where they see President Biden struggling and former President Trump wants to, you know, be the, the sort of strong man on the world stage, which he has said time and time again. And his team looks like they're letting him do just that. And, Dasha, we should point out that uh, we are seeing live pictures right now of the former president uh, and his wife, Melania, as they're walking in to vote. Uh, today, of course, is the Florida primary. This, of course, already sewn up for him uh, as he is the presumptive Republican nominee with no other uh, opponent still in the race. But yet he is going to exercise his ability to vote for himself. Um, uh, you know, maybe expand on that point you were making, uh, Dasha, about uh, the campaign essentially letting Trump be Trump uh, and doubling down, kind of powering through when he makes comments like this. Are they just operating under the assumption that they aren't going to turn any voters off, uh, at least not the voters that were inclined to vote for Trump to begin with? This might be, uh, Ryan, an election that is a game of voter suppression rather than trying to reach across the aisle and bring new folks in. And I think that is a bit of the the MO of, of frankly, both the Trump team and uh, the Biden team, where they are using the negatives of the other side as a way to, again, rally the base and also maybe just tamp down some of the support, hope that uh, people that are you never Trumpers and the people that are frustrated with how Biden's handling things simply don't show up and that helps uh, boost them. And so for the former president, as he's been pivoting from the primary to the general, you know, sometimes you see a moderating of tone, you see a shift in rhetoric. That's not happening here clearly. And this is a call out to the base. This is a rallying of the troops that are already in and potentially, uh, you know, just, just getting those folks engaged who haven't necessarily been paying attention. I think they see things like the news cycle around the bloodbath comments as potentially a positive, just in that he is in the ether, he is in people's faces, he is in the headlines. That's something that really the former president thrives on. Okay, Dasha Burns uh, with the former president in Palm Beach. Let's uh, shift gears now and head up uh, to Ohio, where there is a competitive primary taking place today, at least in terms of the U.S. Senate race, and that's where Henry Gomez is. Uh, so, Henry, uh, you've covered these individuals in Ohio politics for quite a bit. Uh, talk to us today about what this primary means for the direction of the Republican Party in Ohio. Well, Ryan, it's a it's a classic battle between Trump's MAGA movement and the old guard Republican establishment here in the Buckeye State. Uh, Ohio Governor Mike DeWine, who really is an emblem of that pre-Trump Republican Party, has endorsed State Senator Matt Dolan, who is very similarly styled, you know, old school conservative Republican, talks a lot about tax cuts, doesn't talk a lot about these culture wars and uh, some of the the strongman stuff that, uh, that Trump's really into. But then Trump has endorsed businessman Bernie Marino, who is a political newcomer, who has been really without Trump's endorsement would not have 
much of a chance in today's primary. But as it stands, we came into the final days here with uh, Moreno and Matt Dolan, sort of neck and neck in polls, really a toss up as all of my Republican sources on the ground here have been telling me. Trump came in Saturday and did a rally for Moreno. And we've just seen a steady parade of sort of MAGA world uh, influencers coming in to flood the zone and campaign with Bernie Moreno. Carrie Lake has been here. Uh, Christy Nome, the South Dakota governor, has been here. J.D. Vance, who of course is an Ohioan and won the Senate race two years ago with Trump's help, has been campaigning alongside Moreno. Whereas as Dolan has been relying on the Mike DeWine endorsement, as well as an endorsement from former Senator Rob Portman, who's also cut from that same traditional GOP cloth. So the stakes really, you know, the battle lines really couldn't be any clearer. There is a third candidate, Secretary of State Frank LaRose. He has sort of fallen behind in polls over the last week or so, as Dolan and Marino have spent a ton of money on television to get their message out there. And, and again, it's just been really, really nasty over the last few days with uh, the Trump folks calling Matt Dolan Mitt Dolan, which is, of course, a reference to Mitt Romney, and um, Matt Dolan himself talking about how there's too much shouting right now on politics, and it's time to elect people who can go to Washington and actually get things done. When I asked Matt Dolan if that was a, a shot at Trump, he, uh, he demurred and said no, it was more a critique on leaders who are already in Washington. But you can just really see where this is headed in the final hours, just a very, very clear uh, battle versus MAGA and not MAGA. And, and Democrats, you know, this is their seat right now. This is uh, Sherrod Brown is the incumbent. Uh, they, they believe they've got a shot there, despite how much uh, Ohio has turned red. And the Democrats are, are getting involved, right? They have a horse uh, in this Republican primary. Explain how they're uh, intervening, if you, if you will, uh, in the primary. Yeah, that's right. I mean, last week we saw an ad from the, a Democratic super PAC that's closely aligned with Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. They put money behind an ad that highlights Bernie Marino's conservative credentials, highlights the Trump endorsement. And it, it really is, like, if you watch it closely, it seems like it could be an ad for Bernie Marino. They hope that it helps lift him out of this primary. They feel that he's an easier opponent for Sherrod Brown in November because he's sort of a blank slate. He's a businessman, doesn't have a record, but he does have some record in business that they hope to exploit. And uh, they put, you know, more than $3 million behind this ad. One uh, Republican told me it's the best ad that Bernie Marino has had this entire cycle. <laughs> wow, that's crazy. All right, Henry, thank you for uh, that report from Ohio. We appreciate it. And as we mentioned, the Buckeye State is key in the 2024 fight for Senate control. Right now, Democrats have a very slim margin, only 51 to 49 in the Senate. That, of course, includes the three independents who caucus with the Democrats. Of the 34 Senate seats on the ballot in November, and this is crazy, Democrats are defending 23 of them, many of them in pretty red states. That's because these races are holdovers from the ones that Democrats won in that wave year of 2018. Now, what that means is that Republicans have multiple places where they can pick up seats, but Democrats have nearly no pickup opportunities. According to our friends at the Cook Political Report, there are 10 Democratic-held seats that have a chance of flipping. That includes the toss-ups in Arizona, Montana, and Ohio. And with incumbent Democrat Joe Manchin retiring, they have West Virginia rated as solid Republican. So that means if Democratic incumbents like Sherrod Brown in Ohio or John Tester in Montana lose, even if Democrats run the table in the other seats they hold, it's highly likely that Republicans flip the chamber. Because on the Republican side, our friends at Cook have no races ranked more competitive than likely Republican, and both those seats have well-funded Republican incumbents. Joining me now is the brain behind those Senate rankings, Cook Political Report Senate and Governor's Editor uh, Jessica Taylor. I, I think Democrats are well aware of their challenge coming up uh, in this election cycle, but it's important for us to remind them. But let's talk about Ohio. Depending on how this primary ends today, does that change your thinking about how competitive this race could be in, no in November? It wouldn't change our rating because I still think Sherrod Brown is the most vulnerable Democrat, actually. Even more, even though the numbers say it should be John Tester, Tester has sort of a unique appeal in Montana. His approval ratings have been upwards of 60 percent. And so that's a 16-point Trump state. Ohio has gone twice by eight points for Trump. So I think it's sort of Brown is, is in the toughest lane there. Now, you can see, again, as Henry mentioned from the ads from Chuck Schumer's pack, they would much rather, rather face Marino. They feel mm -hmm. like he is he's a first-time candidate. He ran last time but didn't... Uh, but dropped out before the primary. Um, so sort of more of a political neophyte. They feel like he's been a little more 
um, unscripted on the trail. And, it's, you know, it's just first time candidate brings some vulnerabilities in a way that a state senator like Matt Dolan doesn't. And that Dolan sort of has more of those establishment credentials. He has more appeal, I think, to sort of those suburban swing voters um, that they're going to need uh, that really they could say, OK, I might not vote for Marino if it's if it's uh, if it's uh, Brown and Marino, but maybe maybe Dolan and things, too. So I absolutely think that Dolan would be more formidable. But that doesn't mean that this isn't going to be a race, even if it is Marino. Yeah. It, it, you mentioned how narrow this road is mm -hmm. for the Democrats. I do feel we've been writing the epitaph for the Democratic Senate majority yeah. for the last couple cycles, and they've somehow been able to sneak out uh, a victory and a majority. This is a different a different map for them, isn't it? I mean, yeah. do they basically have to run the entire table if West Virginia is off mm -hmm. the board? Is that the only way they can hold on to the majority? They have to run the entire table and win the White House. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about Trump winning the White House, they've already lost it because if you consider that seat for Joe Manchin gone, which we do in the Republican column, that brings it to 50-50, and then the deciding vote would be a Republican vice president. Mm -hmm. So they have to sort of pray that Biden still wins, and they have to win every single Senate race. Mm -hmm. Now, last time in 2022, they faced a very uphill path as well. They didn't lose any incumbent uh, in Democratic incumbent, and they were able to flip Pennsylvania. So they sort of pitched a perfect game. Mm -hmm. Now, pitching a perfect game twice in a row is really, really hard to do, though. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, we've already talked about the primary in Ohio, but there are primaries in other places. Mitch McConnell has often talked about candidate quality. Mm -hmm. Candidate quality may have been the reason Republicans were unsuccessful in 2020. How much will that matter this time around? It absolutely, I think, cost them very winnable races in Pennsylvania, in Arizona, and in Georgia. And we have seen the National Republican Senatorial Committee be more involved in these primaries. Now, they didn't endorse in Ohio, um, but they went heavy, for instance, behind uh, Tim Sheehy, their top recruit in Montana, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, Trump also endorsed him, and then his challenger, uh, Congressman Matt Rosendale, dropped out, so they've avoided a primary there. Uh, you know, they uh, Carrie Lake, they've they've gotten behind in Arizona. Now, she is still sort of one of those untested, un you know, more volatile candidates that they hope to avoid. Um, there is a messy primary still in Michigan, though Trump has weighed in there behind Mike Rogers. Um, so they've they've endorsed in some places, uh, you know, uh, in, in Pennsylvania. Now they have David McCormick, a self funder running against um, running against Bob Casey there. So they've gotten better candidates in some places, but places yeah. like Ohio, Michigan, they're still primary. OK, we're in March Madness season, so <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot here. Go Vols. What, <laughs> what is your sleeper? Is there a sleeper race that we're not thinking about that we're going to wake up the day after the election and be a little surprised? by the result? Um, that's a very good question. I, you know, Maryland is one that sneaks up there. Mm -hmm. I still have a hard time. We have it rated likely uh, Democrat at this point, but they, Dem Republicans really got a coup when they convinced mm -hmm. uh, former Governor Larry Hogan, who's still very popular in the state, to run there. We'll see who ends up winning that Democratic yeah. primary there. So I'm still keeping an eye on it. I still remain very skeptical because yeah. we've seen sort of red state governors run in uh, Democrats like Phil Bredesen and um, you know Steve right. Bullock run and not be successful because governor's right. races are ultimately very different than Senate races. Okay, but we're holding you to it. It's going to be Maryland or nothing. That's Jessica Taylor <laughs> sleeper. I'm just kidding. Thanks, Jessica. We'll see how your balls do. Yes. <laughs> All right. Turning now to a former Trump White House official behind bars. Peter Navarro, a top advisor to Donald Trump when he was in office, reported to prison in Miami this afternoon after the Supreme Court rejected his attempt to delay his four-month sentence. Navarro was convicted of contempt of Congress last year after resurfaced, right. or refusing, I should say, to comply with a subpoena from the House Committee investigating the January 6th attack on the Capitol. Navarro was defiant while speaking to reporters today, airing his grievances about his prosecution, pitching himself as a victim of political prosecution, and voicing his loyalty to the former president. I will walk proudly in, in there and do my time. I will gather strength from this. Donald John Trump is the nominee for the Republican presidential campaign. At Navarro sentencing in January, the U.S. District Judge presiding over the case said he was not a victim, despite his claims. Up next, we're on the trail with President Biden in battleground Nevada. We're live in Las Vegas after a quick break. You're watching Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Moments ago, President Biden arrived in Las Vegas, the second stop on his trip to Nevada. Earlier today, he was in Reno, part of the Washoe County, which the Biden campaign is calling the swingiest county in the swingiest state. 
President Biden narrowly won Nevada four years ago. And his campaign says defending the Silver State is a 2024 top priority. NBC News spoke to Nevada voters ahead of the president's trip today about the issues that will decide who they support in November. And who do you think you're siding with at this point in time? Uh, Donald Trump. For what reason? Just, I think our country was in a really good spot prior to, you know, he was when he was president, it was a really good spot. Things that went kind of down south. I mean, we obviously know that, but I think... You know, I just think it's going to, we need to do what's best for the country. Biden's iffy. I know he's older, but he has standards, and I think he really cares about what's going on for the country and is doing the best that he can do. NBC News White House correspondent Aaron Gilchrist is traveling with the president. He joins us now from Las Vegas. Uh, So, Aaron, what's President Biden's message to Nevada voters today? Well, Brian, the president is headed this way, and this is technically a, uh, a, an official White House event here today where the president will focus, as you can see from the signage behind me, on lowering housing costs. This is something he mentioned during his State of the Union address, and today will detail his proposal, a $258 billion housing proposal that he says would lower housing costs for Americans by way of increasing the housing supply. They're proposing that this plan would help to uh, either build or renovate $2 million Uh, housing units across the country, at the same time lowering costs, providing tax credits to homeowners and to renters as well to make housing more affordable for those groups. This is something that the president is going to talk about in front of an audience that is largely one of supporters. There are people we've spoken to in this crowd who say that the president still has to do some work to earn their votes. This is, as you mentioned, a swing state uh, where people feel like they're independent voters, they're swing voters, and they're not just going to give their vote away. There are a lot of union folks in the crowd here today as well uh, who say that they support President Biden because he supports unions. And the work that he's done so far around uh, housing and lowering costs has helped union workers in this particular area here in Clark County and Las Vegas and across the state of Nevada and in other parts of the Southwest as well, Ryan. Uh, You know, uh, President Biden is struggling with Latino voters right now. How does he hope to break through to them, especially in a state like Nevada? Well, I think the campaign would say that part of their effort is around showing up. They're going to be in states like Nevada, where the population, 30 percent of the population is Latino. They're going to go to places like Arizona. They just today released a a new campaign ad that uh, they've released in English, Spanish, and Spanglish, as the campaign has said, a mix of Spanish and English. And the idea is that they want to get in front of Latino voters here, in front of black voters, in front of Asian uh, and Pacific uh, Pacific Islander voters as well, to talk about what President Biden has done for those communities. And they also intend to talk about the challenges that would be presented by a second Trump administration. They're going to tackle issues of immigration, uh, uh, economic issues, uh, election denialism issues, as well as abortion in in speaking to those particular communities, Ryan. Okay, Aaron Gilchrist, live for us in Las Vegas. Thank you for that, Aaron. And after Las Vegas, President Biden will head to another battleground state, Arizona, which, as we mentioned earlier, is holding its presidential primary today. And while Biden has already clinched the Democratic nomination, pro-ceasefire activists in Arizona are using today's election to send a message to him about the Israel-Hamas war. And they're doing it in a different way than in past primaries. NBC News campaign embed Alex Tebbit has more. In the heart of downtown Phoenix... Hi, good afternoon. Is this Emma? Vote Ceasefire Arizona, a group protesting President Biden's handling of the Israel-Hamas war phone banking ahead of election day. We're calling people about the presidential preference election. But unlike states like Michigan and Minnesota, where uncommitted is an option on the ballot, Arizona activists who want to send a message to President Biden are having to improvise. We are asking folks to vote for Marion Williamson. A candidate who has publicly called for a ceasefire. We're not looking to win. We're looking to make an impact. Belen Sisa used to work as the National Latino Press Secretary for the 2020 Bernie Sanders campaign. We're going to invest in our young people. Now she's one of the activists behind Vote Ceasefire AZ. Our country and our taxpayer dollars are taking part in this and we want it to stop. Their goal is to get to 10,000 votes for Marianne Williamson. That symbolic number, similar to the margin Biden beat Trump by in Arizona in the 2020 general election. We want to take those votes away to send a very clear and measurable message to the Biden administration. If you want us to vote for you, then you need to do better and call for a ceasefire. 
For Rowan Imran, a Palestinian American activist, this campaign is personal. These are real people's lives. This, this is my family's life. Williamson has backed a ceasefire, reiterating her position to NBC News before an event in Scottsdale over the weekend. We have to have a ceasefire. We have to have release of the hostages, and we have to go towards architecture for a two-state solution. There is no other way. But the ceasefire activists have made it clear, even though they're asking people to vote for her, they're not officially endorsing her. Does it bother you that they're not actually endorsing you? No, you know, it's, it's the horse race. It's how things work. President Biden has already clinched the Democratic nomination, but protests calling for an immediate ceasefire have become a hallmark at Democratic events. At recent campaign stops in Arizona, both First Lady Jill Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris were interrupted by protesters. But for Imran, who's anxious about the safety of her friends and family, her message for Biden is simple. Be courageous, take the extra step, and not just use words, because actions are what matter. And our thanks to NBC campaign Edbed Alex Tabbitt for that report. We should note, we, when asked for a response to this effort in Arizona, the Biden campaign told us, quote, the president believes making your voice heard and participating in our democracy is fundamental to who we are as Americans. He's working toward an end to the violence and a just, lasting peace in the Middle East. He's working tirelessly to that end. And after the break, trumped up rhetoric, primary politics, and third party problems. The panel is next. You're watching Meet the Press Now. Welcome back. As the centrist group No Labels gains ballot access across the country, it appears to be running into a big problem. And, and this is a pretty big problem for a presidential campaign. They can't find a candidate. According to my NBC News colleagues, more than a dozen prominent individuals from the world of politics and, and beyond have rebuffed approaches from no labels. Republicans from Liz Cheney to Larry Hogan and Brian Kemp have all turned the group down. Same goes for Democrats and Democratic-leaning independents like Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. NBC reports the group has also reached out to businessman Mark Cuban, retired Admiral William McRaven, even the actor Dwayne The Rock Johnson, who would probably have my kids vote, None of them have shown much interest. Joining me now is our panel. No word on whether or not No Labels has reached out to Lisa Desjardins, the correspondent for PBS NewsHour, or Eugene Robinson, a columnist at The Washington Post and an NBC News political analyst, or Matt Gorman, the former advisor to Tim Scott for America campaign. Would any of you like to officially rule yourself out for No Labels right now? Uh, just if to get no, if right nominated, right? I will not run. Right. If elected, I will not serve. <laughs> Well, fair enough. But Lisa, yeah. I, I, we're joking about this because right. should we be taking no labels seriously? I mean, it is quite the feat to get on the ballot in as many states as they have. But if they can't find a candidate, what does it matter? I think that's the right question. We should be taking seriously the group of American voters who do not like either former President Trump or current President Biden as their top choice. That is a serious group of voters that will affect who becomes president next. However, No Labels has not shown that they should be taken seriously. While they are in, I think, 17 states now, mm -hmm. we need to look at those because some of those are key swing states. And if they are able to take voters away, especially from, let's say, it's a Republican-leading candidate, that will matter in North Carolina, a state which Democrats would love to have back, and in other states that are on the ballot. Yeah, and, you know, Eugene, we've seen the same thing happen with centrist groups in 2012 mm -hmm. and 2016. You know, well-known names considered for the ticket. Uh, but they're worried that it's going to hurt their reputation. They're going to be thought of as a spoiler. Could, could we? Because they are. <laughs> right, yeah. But could we ever get to a point where there's a legitimate third-party candidate in a presidential I, race? You know, not not this time, I don't yeah. think. But yeah. um, uh, look, that's a pretty wide range of candidates they're considering, right? Mm -hmm. People they're talking to, and it would theoretically make a big difference. Like which of those people you chose? Because in some, one, some might take more votes away from Donald Trump. Some might take more votes mm -hmm. away from Joe Biden. Um, and, and so uh, they got to make up their minds mm -hmm. what they want to accomplish here, and 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 then try to find a candidate. And that doesn't seem to be going that well for mm -hmm. them. I, I, third parties are hard. Uh, our, our two major parties are so entrenched, and, and when they lose and lose and lose, they tend to regroup and reconstitute themselves and, you know, sort mm -hmm. of they're, they're reborn from the ashes, right. and that's happened over and over again. You know, and, and also, 
American politics gets binary really, really quickly. So suddenly a no-labels candidate is going to have to decide for or against abortion, for or against a ceasefire, right? Exactly. It, it, it always sounds, as it, and on a candidate level, I'll say this, no-labels has done an incredible job getting the ballot in all, in all mm -hmm. these states. That is very hard to do, mm -hmm. very. But you're right, like these candidates, they sound good in theory, but they'll have to take a vice president of, a, of the different party. And how do you, you know, square that circle, so to speak? And also say, I'm very happy, Aaron Rodgers, as a Jets fan, is not running as a VP. <laughs> <laughs> for, 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 for the Kennedy ticket, but you're right. Like it, it is a lot easier said than done. Right. Well, the Jets have a lot more problems than just their quarterback. Darn right. We'll get into that. <laughs> All right. So uh, we need to get into these comments that uh, former President Trump made uh, over the weekend, saying that Jewish Americans who vote for Democrats hate Israel. He just voted in Palm Beach uh, in the Florida primary, and he actually doubled down on those comments. We're going to play a clip of it right now. I think that the Democrats have been very, very opposed to Jewish people. That's true. And to Israel. All you have to do is look at Senator Schumer. What he did with Israel is a disgrace. And I think Israel will probably not forget it very soon. It's, oh, we're doing very well with the Jewish voter, it looks like. And we should do very well. If you look at all of our presidents, they're saying Trump was the best for Israel, by far the best for Israel. And we're doing very well with the Jewish voters. So he's not obviously backing away from this at all, Lisa. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. could there be a penalty to this with Jewish voters and even non-Jewish voters who who seem who might be offended by President Trump's comments? I honestly don't see it. I think that this is a kind of baked-in sort of statement that we've expected from President Trump. Um, he's talked about race for his entire career. He's had um, made clearly racist statements in his career. I don't think this is new. I do think that it is important as a country that at this moment has very real problems with hate and anti-Semitism for us to look at this and to understand the codes that a lot of people will get from the messages he's sending. Yeah. And, and Eugene, uh, this is a problem, though, for Democrats, right? There's a real divide mm -hmm. about the handling of the war uh, with Israel and yeah. Hamas, uh, and it's made it difficult for President Biden. How does he see his way through this? Well, look, I think, that it, I think where it really makes it, it makes it difficult for President Biden uh, is in the crucial swing state of Michigan, for example, where um, Arab Americans are a, a, a big and important voting block. If you're, gonna, if you're a Democrat, you're going to win Michigan, you're going to rack up huge margins in Wayne County, D Detroit metropolitan area, and Dearborn uh, is a majority Arab American city, um, a big suburb of Detroit. Uh, and, and people there are really upset at, uh, at what they see as President Biden's uncritical uh, support of what Prime Minister Netanyahu has, has been doing and the way Israel has conducted the war. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of those voters um, will ultimately probably vote for Biden, mm -hmm. but not all of them, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that that's potentially a big problem in a, in a crucial state. I mean, it could just be tens of 10,000 votes, right, Mac, that could have an impact in a state like Michigan. A thousand percent. And, and a lot of those folks in Michigan with the ceasefire, this, a, lot of this, a lot of the same folks I think about who are voted against Trump in a Republican primary. It's very easy to make that choice in March. Mm -hmm. You know, look yeah. me in the face in late October, mm -hmm. early November, and do it again when it really, really, truly means something. Exactly. I think that it's is the key thing. here. Yeah. You know, different thing. Um, but you're right. It could come down to those, those small margins. And I think what the biggest interesting part of this is Israel on the Democratic side is f divided far more on age. Mm -hmm. um, you see older Democrats far more likely to be staunch supporters of Israel, mm -hmm. where youngers are more likely to be skeptical or more likely to see some sort of, you know, equivalency. And I think that is where you're trying to see Trump kind of carve it up a little bit more among traditional political lines. Yes. And again, uh, you know, Joe Biden needs younger voters. Yeah, yeah he, he needs, does. He needs Ann Arbor as right. well as oh, Dearborn. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I, I, uh, there's a fascinating primary taking place in Ohio today, and I, I want to play an interaction that we had with a Republican a candidate, Matt Dolan, and a voter in Ohio. Take a listen to this. You're following the race. I'm following the race. <laughs> Which your heart says somebody else. My heart says until Trump is gone. Oh, I'm sorry. Trump is gone. I will never vote Dem Republican again. <laughs> Sorry. Your heart is definitely gone. <laughs> it wasn't, but it, I know, I guess. it was the first person, first time I hadn't voted Republican wow. in my life. And yeah. I will never do it again as long as he's in control. Yeah. So, it. sorry. Well, he's well, not a Trump person. So. I know, I realize that. I get you. I get you. I totally get it.
So we, we unfortunately only have about a minute left, but if right. we can quickly all go around. Do you think there are more voters out there that are like this particular voter than maybe we pay attention to? I do think Trump support is softer than people realize. I'm not saying it is radically softer, but I do think it is as an exhaustion factor. I also think in the U.S. Senate, when they have a lot to do this week, mm -hmm. a lot of those Republicans are going to be watching this race in Ohio. I know they are. They've got a big meeting tomorrow. Yeah. I think it's also important to point out that might be a case nationwide, but let's remember Ohio is leaned pretty far right in the Trump years. That might be the exception in Ohio, yeah. where most folks talk about swing states. Ohio really isn't on that list. Right. No, it's not. I correspond with a, with a couple of uh, Trump skeptical or Trump disliking Republicans. Uh, and so far, one is sticking to that. He's not going to vote for Trump. Mm -hmm. One is going to vote for Trump, okay. I, I predict. So right. I think it's going to right. break All right. both ways. Great. Eugene, sample size. Very good. We take it. And these guys <laughs> running for president on the no labels uh, uh, line. Thank you for that. Still to come, two big stories on Capitol Hill. House and Senate leaders play whack-a-mole one more time. Lisa and I know all about this, to avoid a government shutdown. And a retired military officials testify on the Biden administration's ill-fated withdrawal from Afghanistan. You're watching Meet the Press now. But officially sprung here in Washington, the National Park Service announced that the Capitol's beloved cherry blossom trees reached peak bloom status on Sunday. From yesterday's scenic sunrise at the Jefferson Memorial to scenes of pink and crowds of eager tourists and locals around the tidal basin soaking up the spectacle. And if the seasonal treat feels a little early this year, that's because it is. This is the second earliest peak bloom in more than a century of record keeping, thanks to an unusually warm winter. So happy first day of spring, everyone. We'll be right back with more Meet the Press now. Welcome back. Congress is one step closer to averting a government shutdown by the end of the week after congressional leaders in the White House announced this morning they'd reached a deal to fund the remaining federal agencies. That includes the Department of Homeland Security, which had been a sticking point in those talks. Sources familiar with the talks tell NBC News that the deal includes funding the Department of Homeland Security for a full year and not a stopgap bill, as was previously being considered. But Speaker Mike Johnson already facing some pushback from the hard right flank of his party in a letter to their colleagues, top Freedom Caucus leaders Bob Good and Chip Roy, as well as a dozen of other House Republicans, urge lawmakers to block the funding bill, saying that it directly funds Biden's, quote, disastrous policies. Joining me now is Sahil Kapoor on Capitol Hill. So, uh, Sahil, what more do we know about the details of the DHS funding in this bill? Do we know who got more of what they wanted, Democrats or Republicans? We don't really know much about that, Ryan. The details are still somewhat of a mystery. Uh, the negotiators who announced the deal have not released a summary. They have not released legislative text yet. I just spoke moments ago to Senator Dick Durbin, the number two uh, Democrat in the chamber. He chairs the committee that oversees immigration enforcement. Even he said he hasn't seen the details of all of this. So this seems like a, a, a close negotiation that occurred between uh, President Biden uh, and his staff, as well as Speaker Mike Johnson and his staff. This was a White House and House Republican venture. That's another thing that Democratic aides on uh, the Hill have been telling me when I asked for the details. It sounds like there were some real concessions made from the White House's side, but also a product you know, of the fact that President Biden has recognized that his approach on immigration hasn't really been working, that he wants more resources uh, to do some tougher immigration enforcement while also keeping it humane so he doesn't have to do the kind of very harsh Trump policies. Now, also happening on Capitol Hill today, uh, Saw Hill, a, 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 what at times was a tense hearing related to the Afghanistan withdrawal with some former military generals. Uh, what, did, what came out of this hearing? What did we learn about this investigation by the House Foreign Affairs Committee and what could it lead to? Yeah, this seems like an attempt to shake some trees after that situation in Afghanistan. Talking to two generals who are now retired in the hope that maybe they would reveal more information. Uh, one of them was General uh, Kenneth McKenzie, who led CENTCOM at the time from 2019 to 2022, said that he was the overall commander and he alone bears full responsibility for what happened at that so-called Abbey Gate situation. He also did place some blame on the State Department, saying that the order for the evacuation uh, came a little bit too late. There was also testimony from General Mark Milley, who was uh, then the chairman of the uh, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he agreed that simply uh, for the families who lost out in this, he said, we owe them answers. And he said, there's nothing that I can say or do that's going to fill that gaping hole in your heart. Ryan. 
Yeah, and I know there's some Republicans that believe that Republicans maybe should be focused on this investigation a little bit more than the impeachment inquiry into President Biden because they believe that there's a lot here to uncover. So we'll have to see how this all plays out. Sahil Kapoor, thank you so much for your work there on Capitol Hill. We appreciate it. And we, of course, are back tomorrow with more Meet the Press Now. But there's more news straight ahead with Hallie Jackson right now. Thanks for watching. Stay updated about breaking news and top stories on the NBC News app or follow us on social media.